Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having joined us today. Uh, it's a very special day for all of us here, uh, especially for those of us who are into the management of fibroids. Uh, Alembic is really, really fortunate uh, to have on board uh, a very, very renowned panel. Each and every one of you know them inside out. I will, of course, uh, try and introduce, and I'm saying the word try and introduce because there can never be enough words to that would actually justify the caliber and the quality of the moderator of our webinar today. Nobody else than the very, very renowned and famous Dr. Niranjan Chavan. Firstly, a deep debt of gratitude to Dr. Chavan to have agreed to moderate the session for us. It's indeed a great honor. Of course, like I said, he needs no introduction, but everybody here knows that he is the professor and unit chief at the very famous Sion Hospital. He's been the joint treasurer of Foxy, right 21 and still till 24. The vice president, MOGS, again 21 to 22, and a host and a host of other appointments and responsibilities that he's very ably done over a period of time. 54 publications in international and national journals with over 73 citations. I mean, the list, like you can see, is endless. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, I would now, at this stage, uh, want to hand over to Dr. Niranjan Chavan uh, to take us through a very interesting webinar. It actually promises to be very interesting uh, uh, because the molecule that we're going to be talking of uh, has, has been there. It's been evasive. It's come back. And I'm sure there'll be a huge number of questions uh, around all of that and more, which is why Olympic has decided to organize this so that the knowledge transfer by very famous practitioners can come across to all of you. Thank you ever so much and over to you, Dr. Chavan. Thank you, Mr. Suri, and thank you at the outset, Alembic Pharmaceuticals, who have been kind and generous enough to connect all of us through the TOG platform of Science Integra. Ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor to have all of you back on this 2AG webinar as you are aware the life has been different and difficult for many of us in the last two years and i hope and we all hope that you have taken your shots your boosters and are safe in home and still ready for academics we are very very extremely happy today to invite our senior guests of this country and the loved world over none other than dr narendra malotra and Dr. Manjula Anagani. It's great to have both of you, Dr. Professor Narendra Malhotra, in spite of his age and hectic schedule, he is still ready to join with us and he has been kind enough to be there today. Well, as you are aware, he is the Managing Director of Global Rainbow Healthcare and he has got a set of lot of activities in the field of IVF, in the field of cosmetic gynecology, in the field of ultrasound, in the field of non-invasive modalities of managing fibroids and he has been also the professor of Dobroy Nick International University of Croatia. I can go on and on. What any other feather is left in his hat? Just tell me sir. Everything from Foxy to Safog to IFUMB to AOGS and the most famous of all the Iron Donald courses which he has taken in each and every nook and corner of India trained more than 10,000 gynecologists by now and is always an institute and an inspiration to all the Foxians which, which are there presented over 125 papers 500 pre presented papers and more than 1000 guest lectures sir I can go on and on but without much ado, I would like to thank to you to be here present today. And I hand over the mic now to you, sir, to please go ahead and talk something very, very different. Last two years, things have changed. What two years ago, we had non-invasive modalities. And today, when we are in 2022, things have changed. And that's what sir is going to talk today about is non-invasive methods of managing fibroids. I hand over the mic to you, sir. The platform is yours. Thank you so much for coming. A very, very good evening to all of you. It's indeed a pleasure of mine 
to be here associated with TOG once again and uh, to talk on a very, very favorite topic of mine, non-surgical management of uterine fibroid. Of course, I will uh, tell you all the modalities and touch a little bit about medical to make the ground for Manjula to carry on with the Uliprostol talk. So greetings to all of you. It's indeed a pleasure always to be associated with uh, Niranjan and his work and with Science Integra. We know that fibroid is a very prevalent disease and 25% of women who have fibroid will be symptomatic. So you see it almost in 40% of the women and the increasing age, menopause, early menarche, family history, nulli paras, high BMI, all that has fibroids. But we have to understand because when we're talking about treatment, we understand how these fibroids develop the pathophysiology. Now, a single uterine smooth muscle connective tissue replicates and forms a cluster of cells and that is distinct from the surrounding. And with some genetic factors and the hormonal estrogen progesterone influence, this starts growing and forms tumors, benign tumors, which are known as fibroids, could be anywhere. And today it has been shown it is more that the progesterone receptors which are um, responsible. So we need to know how to invest investigate what are the goals of treatment, what we want to do and what actually we will do. So to know that we must classify them because some of the fibroids, you can leave them alone, three and four type, maybe some of the five type, number five, which are very small, can all be left alone and will not interfere with the menstrual uh, abnormalities and will not interfere with the fertility also, including seven, except for mechanical pressures. So sometimes you need to treat the bigger seven type and six type ones also. When we look at the treatment, there are medical treatments, hormonal, non-hormonal, there are surgical treatment, but what we are doing today is going to talk to about other modalities, which is the uterine artery embolization, embolization, magnetic uh, radio frequency treatment, and uh, the MRI guided focused uh, ultrasound treatment. So the current therapies would, are they satisfactory or not, will depend on the age of the patient, the childbearing expectation, the extent and severity of the symptoms, the size and location of the myomas, the proximity to menopause because it can leave it alone if it's asymptomatic and with menopause it will regress by itself But and the risk of malignancy in these. So we do the general investigation and some special investigations which I'm going to show you which uh, we started doing now is the 3D sonohistrography to know it's the involvement of the cavity and the contrast TBS imaging. So we inject contrast into the uterine cavity and we inject contrast IV also. And that goes into the fibroid and maps it. The others are all additional uh, investigative tools which might help. But transvaginal ultrasound, 3D contrast with cell line and with contrast sonoview is what is required. Color Doppler is required because this is a huge fibroid. So I need to know before I operate or I embolize whether it has a single big artery. It can You can embolize that. And whether it's a big artery, it has to be surgically removed. So you have to be careful that it is going to bleed or not. So vascularity pattern is needed to plan for the treatment. And we do the vascularity pattern like this. So there's a peripheral vascularity and we can draw the lines and give it to the radiation guy uh, who will do the embolization or who will focus the radio frequency or the MRI focus ultrasound on the vessels and on the soft fat tissue. So a contrast tuned imaging is very, very important. Uh, it's got a huge lot of in, uh, indications now, but in fibroid and adenomyosis, this is what is new. Then of course we have the algorithm which will lead to surgery, hysteroscopic or laparoscopic, medical treatment, or the option of non-medical, non-surgical treatment, which we are going to talk about uh, today in detail and a little bit about the medical thing. So when we talk of surgery, we divide, uh, when we talk of treatment, we divide into surgical therapy, medical therapy, non-surgical alternatives. Surgical, of course, is hysterectomy, myomectomy, laparoscopic, hysteroscopic, cryomyolysis, thermocoagulation, mini lap, laparotomy, or laparoscopy. Medical treatment are GnRH and today sperms, not the sperms which come out, SPRMS, selective progesterone receptor modulators, which we are going to listen more in detail from Dr. Manjula today. 
And what I'm going to take you through is uterine artery embolization, UAE, magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound surgery or MGRGFUS and ultrasound guided radio frequency ablation, which is the new one, which is coming very soon. So do we do expectant treatment? Yes. If menopause is coming, if it's asymptomatic, leave it alone, depending on what the patient's age is, whether she wants preservation of fertility, the, you choose between expectant and definitive management. Asymptomatic, small fibroids are best left alone. Please don't mess with her. Symptomatic fibroids can be treated medically, surgically, combination or non-surgical. So let's see what are the non-surgical methods. The non-surgical methods is embolization where polyvinyl particles are put into the uterine artery or we can also put them specifically in the fibroid artery. That is why the fibroid artery uh, vessel uh, is very, very important to look at. And this is done by through the femoral artery like here. And this is catheterized like this with this tube and it goes into the vessels. The other is HIFU, high frequency, and you have focused ultrasound coming from below and which focuses at the fibroid and will burn, burn the tissue off and regress it. So that is how we do. Now let's come to embolization. So contrast enhanced sonography, which I just told you by giving Sonoview or Levovist IV. And then, you know, it goes into the, uh, into the fibroid area and then MRI guided, you can focus the area or you do a embolization ultrasound guided or imaging guided, fluoroscopic guided within the cath lab or in the imaging lab and cannulate or reach the uterine artery main or the anterior branch or even if it is a big fibroid specifically into that fibroid branch. And we can specifically cannulate each of the fibroid branch if there are multiple fibroids, if the patient is desirable for fertility, because then you don't need to uh, embolize the full uterine artery and the uterine artery remains functioning for the rest of the uterus. So this is what I was talking to you about vascular imaging. Now that is the color Doppler imaging and this is the contrast. We've given IV contrast and see how it shines through. And this is very, very essential to tell us about the cent centripetal filling pattern, the basket pattern in early phase and diffuse enhancement in late phase. And often the feeding capsular vessels is seen at the periphery. So this, and of course, it tells us whether uh, the malignant changes or potential malignancy is there. So this is what is new, which is there. Then, of course, we have the UAE. And uh, by it is done by interventional radiologist with a gynecologist helping him or guiding at that time polyvinyl alcohol PVA particles, which are 500 to 700 mu or gel foam particles are used to embolize 60 to 65% reduction on size of the fibroid will be seen. And uh, 80 to 90% improvement. See, now that is the uterine artery, which is very beautifully seen. And then you see each vessel going to the fibroid. So if I embolize here, then the whole blood supply goes off. So if the patient is not desirable of fertility, we do the uterine artery, main artery, or the anterior branch or the posterior branch, which is supplying. So this imaging uh, is very, very important and guides you which artery. And if it is a big single fibroid, then we can specifically go and embolize only that, that vessel. So we can go there like this and embolize only this vessel or only this vessel or the main uterine artery. So that is very, very important. See, now this is the main vessel to this fibroid. And if we, if I embolize here, this vessel will also go. So we can cannulate. You see how the cannula is moving towards this vessel and uh, in slow motion. And then we will inject the gel foam particles or the polyvinyl particles right here. So all the blood supply, this fibro or fibroids are fortunately single peripheral major vessel. And you uh, then the blood supply gets cut off and 60 to 75% reduction is seen within two, three, four weeks. See that now the particles are being left and the particles are being injected. You can see that and they're going, particles are going and they're going to block each and every branch of this feeder vessel of this, uh, of this fiber. So that it will make the, it more successful. So this you can see in the, how, how, it, how these particles the micro bubbles in these particles go into whichever vessel. So if I inject here, it will go in both the vessels. 
phageject here and cannulate here, it will go in the specific vessel. So uterine artery fibroid embolization or uterine fibroid uh, embolization is a good treatment modality which we have, which can be done. Of course, see that's the fluoroscopic view which we did in our center. Unfortunately, this video suddenly has not worked in my check, but I'm sorry. But here I injected in the main and with my interventional radiologist. This was the diagrammatic picture. We went like that and injected here main. And you see the particles went and immobilized. So it's a very safe method. The recurrence rate might occur because of the collateral uh, developing, but uh, the pain and the symptoms reduce. And this is the kind of uh, this thing uh, probe which we have uh, from which is cannulated to the spine. And again, I told you that we so three dimensional power Doppler will differentiate whether this polyp needs a surgical removal or we can do actually, if you see the main vessel, we can actually cannulate this vessel, embolize this and this polyp is going to fall off. So that is the kind of treatment. So desiring fertility, they will need surgical removal if they're not desiring. And similarly, adenomyces can be done. So which is confusing with the fibroid. Now, very vascular fibroids will respond much better to embolization. So very vascular fibroids, but there is a contraindication. If there is a pregnancy with fibroid, we cannot um, do embolization of that because the pregnancy will get affected. If malignancy is suspected, do not do it, do treatment. This is a pregnancy fibroid, which I'm removing, huge fibroid. After delivering the baby, we just give an incision. And see, people are scared of doing this surgical cesarean myomectomy. It's not that difficult. You already are used to cutting the uterus all open. So why are you scared of cutting it here and removing? you used to cutting the uterus, delivering the baby and suturing it back. So why are you scared of just taking out this fibroid from wherever it is? Uh, you can just inject a little bit of pitrosine so it becomes practically bloodless. Then um, if there's renal empowerment, if desire of uh, this thing, those are con. And remember, as I told you, high vascularity, solitary fibroids, the success rate of embolization much more. Post-embolization, the patient may get some fever, vomiting, pain, and, and if the, ves the vessel leaks, it can lead to ovarian failure. Let's come to the next modality. The next modality is magnetic resistance guided focused ultrasound. Or MRI, FUS. The patient lies prone. The beam is going to go from below and the MRI is going to focus it and we will focus the ultrasound focus beam goes here. So precise targeting of the tissue, monitoring of therapy by assessing the temperature of the treated tissue, advantages, very low morbidity, very rapid recovery and very less. And because the fibroids have a lot of fat, high concentration, lipomyomas, these will respond much more because they are respond to the heating, which is the focused heating. So these type of, and that is how it is done. The MRI is machine is there and it's, it's uh, of course needs, it's a technical thing. And you see uh, it will focus it and the ultrasound beam is from below. So a ult focused ultrasound, one person will be handling like here and where you've identified where the uterus is, whichever symptom, the focus beam will be turned and uh, guided towards that area and will be fired here on the fibroid. And you can simultaneously monitor the regression. So real-time monitoring and a thermal feedback monitoring. So you need to do an MRI to plan and focus the beam there. And then you need you fire the ultrasound till it does not heat too much because that can cause thermal damage to the whole of the uterus. So that continuous monitoring is done. So planning, treatment, thermometry, like here, this is the thermal measurement. And then you get a graph evaluation and adjustment. And then of course, uh, we will uh, go ahead and carry on the treatment. So it is enables very accurate positioning and very accurate focusing of the beam on the fibroid area and see the patient just walks up and wakes up and walks up after walks out and uh, no hospitalization, nothing required. And this is one of the fertility sparing options uh, which we have. So if you want to spare fertility, yes, you can opt for this. And then uh, you follow it by MRIs. So regrowth of the fibroids when pregnancy has occurred, we see that the fibroid only that small is left and no regrowth has occurred. Many, many studies have shown that. Uh, magnetic uh, MRI FUS represents 
a very, very safe method for blading fibroids and also adenomatic tissues. Now, this was done. And then later on, she went and hysterectomy, me. And we saw that the adenomyces along with the fibroid also got treated or cured with, cured with it. So this was done for a study. And then when you follow up, you follow up with them with a color Doppler. So the vascularity is reduced and the size is reduced dramatically. The last non-invasive, non-surgical is the Future Hope, the Sonata treatment device. And this is ultrasound guided, focused radio frequency ab ablation. So you have a probe and through the hysteroscope or through the laparoscope, it is kept on the side of the fibroid and then the wave is fired. So this is known as the ECSA procedure. Now, see through the end laparoscopy, we're putting it, that's a fibroid. And see that is the flat part is the where the ultrasound beam is going to come. And you keep it on the surface. You're also monitoring it by ultrasound side by side. So this is the ultrasound, which is monitoring the fibroid. And you're focusing the, uh, the and see that is how it is being fired. So this is going to be a great revolution. But it has to be done with the under the laparoscopic guidance with the, and this is again minimum. See, see the see the movement here, and that's you. You're just stabilizing it and then firing the beam from the side. So those were the non-surgical. Quickly telling you what medical you can do. Medical is to reduce the size. Medical is uh, the drugs used are many right from tranexamic acid to OCP to NACs to progesterones to estrogen receptors, SERMs, GnRH agonist, antagonist, mifeprostone, and the uliprostol has come back again, ladies and gentlemen, with uh, uh, a bang, aromatase inhibitors, estrogen receptor modulators, herbal preparations, all, we have a huge armamentarium of all of them to manage. Tranexamic acid stops bleeding, oral contraceptives regulate the cycle, vitamins will take care of the uh, hemoglobin, NACH will take care of the pain, progesterone releasing intrauterine device will cause uh, atrophy of the endometrium, so bleeding will be less, levonorgestrel devices, GnRH will stop the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, so ovarian hormones will reduce, antagonists will do it much faster and better, but depot antagonists are not yet available. So once they are freely available, RU486 can also reduce fibroid size now because it will cause severe permanent hoarseness of women's voice. And we don't want women to have hoarse voice. So that is very, very important. Please, Danazol, just throw Danazol out of your armamentarium. And they all have their own drawbacks. So there was a look for a, a good medical treatment. And then came, of course, the uh, pathology that progesterone is vital. Uh, so we need selective progesterone receptor modulators, perms. Uh, Telepersonal estate, all these. So uliprostol came, then it was in um, dispute, but it has come back again with all the studies and this all over the world. And uh, it will reduce work on the fibroid directly, HPO axis on the ed endometrium. And that is it. The other drugs um, are there. There are nice guidelines of what fibroid should be treated by what drug and why and what method. So, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, uh, fibroids, symptomatic need treatment. Asymptomatic can be left alone. You can try medical treatment first. If they don't respond, you in the uterine cavity and they need to be removed uh, if they if you have to do fertility. So take home messages, asymptomatic, leave them alone, some mucus, remove them, uliprostol, three to four courses, try them and then do the myomectomy. Very big fibroids, you can do UAE before that, not willing for surgery, do MR, FUS, or if you, now we will get ultrasound focused, that will be much better. If, it, if she's more of age and menopause and perimenopause, symptomatic hysterectomy is better. And of course, uh, you, you do UAE, MR, and ultrasound guided, all those are there. Thank you very much. I send you greetings from my city, city of Taj. And I thank you in all the possible Indian languages, which, uh, which I know, which are here. Thank you very much, Dr. Niranjan, for inviting me. Sir, beautiful presentation. You are an encyclopedia and an inspiration. The amount of beautiful slides 
which you have shown with the color with the demonstration the radio frequency way of managing mri fus and the doppler which you find on changes the vascularization sir it was so beautiful experience which everyone went through i have few lectures also but i don't think i can uh, you know even be 10% near near your presentation the way you talk and the way the fluidity which moves not to just praise you but sir it was so good and it was really nice that we have got a lot of appreciations coming up from our viewers who have logged in for 2ag tog webinar brought to you by alembic pharmaceuticals sir if you permit there are three four questions which i would like to take this is doctor yes. uh, from karim nagar doctor sirisha can we plan pregnancy with an intramural fibroid 2 into 2 cm into 1.5 cm into yes. 1.8 cm i will repeat sir can we plan pregnancy with an intramural fibroid of 2 into 2 into 1.5 1.8 cm doctor sirisha from karim nagar sir so small fibroids you can plan pregnancy because intramural pure intramural inside would be difficult to remove and you damage but uh, the cut off for removal of size is so from if it is jutting into the endometrial cavity 2 cm has to be removed if it is not it's purely inside and uh, by cutting it will take more damage so you plan pregnancy yes sir absolutely dr mandakini meg has joined us and she has said dr nm sir good to see you after a long time a nice talk and wonderful presentation thank you dr mandakini for your generous compliments sir this is dr neeti dogra from gorakhpur sir which is the center doing in india in northern india sir mri fus so mri if you as there is a center in bombay hyderabad bangalore one in delhi and very soon we are starting in agra on our, our own so Excellent. we have an interventional radiologist now available and probably in the next 6 months we'll be doing it okay this is dr viba upadhyay from agra management of sub serous anterior wall fibroid 4.5 cm size before planning pregnancy so what would you recommend it is a sub serous anterior wall 4.5 cm fibroid before she is planning to do pregnancy dr viba upadhyay has said sir do we go for a surgery or we just leave it alone so now here is a tricky part 4.5 to 5 cm fall into surgical removal category now even if they are sub serous i if given a personal choice i would like to remove and then plan pregnancy but uh, why because with the pregnancy this fibroid is going to grow and once it grows a lot of people will not agree with me even i have not agreed with myself sometimes and let it happen but then i've got this fibroid went up to 10 cm in pregnancy so 10 cm pregnancy it got stuck in the liver in one month the patient so when i did a cesarean and i tried to pull the uterus out the liver surface started bleeding and i had to call up the uh, gastro surgeon to bleed so i would be a little more aggressive in managing this absolutely absolutely sir so dr gansham jain from titilagar uh, he would like to uh, ask you what should be the maximum number or the size of the fibroid for a medical management so medically uh, more about 5 cm fibroids can be treated medically Absolutely right sir i mean every time it's not necessary to go ahead to do a surgery you need to understand that there is conservative line of treatment and obviously with uh, the modalities which are available with you you can surely go ahead and treat them uh, medically uh, thank you sir now dr sangram kishori sahu from balasor any preventive measures for fibroid something related to diet something related to uh, constitution age bmi exercise high high strung personalities see it's genetic so you cannot change your genes but you can probably change your epigenetics so that the bad genes do not get activated now we all have the bad genes in us but everyone doesn't get cancer we all have cancer genes so those who are living in bad epigenetics and don't care take care of themselves these genes get activated so look after your epigenetics maybe you will uh, it will not come or they will not grow 
but 40% of women will still get fibroids. Absolutely, absolutely. It's all in the genes or whatever the possibilities, epigenes, which are there and that gets usually are the causes for a fibroid. Well, sir, uh, this is Dr. Sushma Pasi from Delhi, a lady 54 year old menopause, two to three years back. Ultrasound shows a uterine fibroid 11 centimeter into 10 centimeter subserous arising from the body of the uterus. Patient doesn't have any complaint and just hardly any feeling of any lump in the abdomen, sir. What would you like to do in this case? So, it is a big fibroid. Big fibroid. problems, it will cause all. And of, it has um, this thing, uh, uh, potential of malignancy. So, the big fibroid, I would like to get it out. Why keep Absolutely. such a big fibroid? Had it been two or three centimeters, four centimeters, I would have left it alone. Absolutely. Uh, there are many questions which are coming, sir. One more last question, Dr. Mridul Tucker. Sir, I have heard that the nerves in the sacrum behind the uterus may be irritated by the treatment. So, whenever you treat, whichever day, that drug does not specifically act on that thing it gives has side effects whenever you do surgery you're doing adhesolysis anything you're making things raw you're causing bleeding something's it so if we, if you're not very careful in your surgery of course yes nerves can get uh, attached and injured well sir thank you so much thank you so much sir for being there and uh, guys if you have missed it there's nothing to be disheartened you will get the recording in the next two days and surely this Sunday you will enjoy Dr. Narendra Malhotra's lecture on TOG platforms supported by Alembic Pharmaceuticals. Thank you so much, sir. I can continue with this on and on. But it was a pleasure to be with you and all of us, our TOG members to be there with you. Thank you so much. Now, we go ahead to our next eminent Padmashri awardee, Dr. Manjula Anagani. What can I say about madam? A down to earth, a big jaw smiling, always helpful, always being kind. See the dedication of her. She has a fractured leg, operated three days back, and she's here to be with you and all of us. See the passion for science. And today, we are going to have Dr. Manjula Anagani from Care Hospital, Hyderabad. She has a Guinness record on her name for the highest number of fibroids removed from a single patient awardee of Padma Shri 2015 she is also a visited, visiting lab surgeon from NMC Hospital Dubai more than 25 years of experience in clinical and academics and has been awarded many 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 more accreditations I am really grateful madam of you to be here today with us and I hand over the mic please Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us from your hospital bed. <laughs> Thank you, Niranjan. No, I reached home. But anyway, oh. Uh, oh, I changed because I think as a surgeon, we all would prefer to stay at home. And let me first share the slides. Okay. Share. When my, when my, uh, can you see the slides? Yes, madam. Yes. So I, it was a wonderful presentation by Dr. Uh, um, Malhotra, sir. Like I said, I always get inspired seeing madam and sir doing so many things in their life. And then we try to do some things and that's when we end up with all these things. But when we were talking about so many non-invasive, minimally invasive, whether they are here to stay or not, we all know that myomectomy and hysterectomy, we are all very, very, very uh, used to as surgeons and we would always prefer that. Then whenever we talk to the patient, patient's choice is always something which we can avoid putting a knife on. That's when comes this MRFUS, whether it is available, whether it is effective, whether it is for pregnancy or not. Then we have a wonderful medicine which has come, which changed the whole scenario, went back and then we are revisiting it again. Why are we revisiting? Why did it go out of work? And is it the right thing to revisit and where should we use? That's where we are right now when we are talking about medical management. We do know that with GnRH analog, we can just suppress the whole hormonal milieu. But according with along with that, we do have the side effects of the GnRH analogs along with the bone 
you know, the fracture which I had. So all the osteoporosis and, and everything which can happen with that. So do we have something which can really help not having so many side effects, but also help in mitigating the effects of uh, uh, fibroids where the surgery cannot act? So we all know, we heard uh, Dr. Narendra Marindra sir talking about fibroids, where it is, how it is, when we should do. But majority of the patient uh, as the age grows will might not have symptoms at all, but we are not talking about them. But in that subgroup, when it is going to affect them psychologically, where they start thinking perimenopausally that we have fibroids, we have fibroids, something has to be done, that itself is a symptom. Why am I saying that when we say asymptomatic patient, we forget to use, utilize the psychological symptom as a symptom, but that itself is a symptom and it is really affecting the psychology of the patient that I have a fibroid, I have to do something about it. It is a symptom apart from the pressure symptoms and the bleeding symptom, which we give important to and the pain. So risk factors, like we say, we all know the metabolic syndrome, which is increasing in the recent times, which has been the cause. And uh, with the um, um, medical tourism going worldwide, it is a woman of African uh, um, uh, woman who come to us for only myomectomy and the number of fibroids are more. The recurrence rates are more and the size of the fibroids are more. We do see 36 week size, 34 week size uterus coming there. They do come with perimenopausal symptoms, with the fibroids, coming for IVF, for pregnancy and with ovarian failures. So we are going to deal with multiple factors in that. So what can we offer her? So it's a benign, most common. If you take irrespective of age, it is 25%. But if you go to above the age of 40, it is 40%. And nearer to the menopause, it is up to as high as 70%. So this is how the prevalence is according to age group. Now, etiology, it keeps changing because as science improves, we keep knowing so many things which happen. And the recent times, we do know the intra fiber, yeah. intra uh, mural prolactin levels also is at uh, fault. And so we started using cabergolin as a treatment, which we started using for fibroid. But we do know it is a growth factors, estrogen, fibrogestron, the cytokines, chemokines, epigenetics, what Dr. Niranjan was talking about, and the genetic factors and the extracellular matrix components, which are uh, the main reason for the pathogenesis. Whether we want treatment or not, we just ask a patient what does they want. There are only two questions we have. When we talk about obstetrics, we always talk, my professor told me, treat obstetrics as maths, then you will never have any issues. I started treating it as maths. That's when I make my, made my life much more easy with obstetrics. So I think when it comes to this fibroid, it has very simple. You want pregnancy? You don't want pregnancy. Okay, you want pregnancy? You want it now or after some time. So what is the problem you have? You have bleeding or pressure. Same way, if you don't want pregnancy, is it the bleeding or pressure? So that way, our life becomes easy that we only have either medical treatment or surgical treatment. So medical treatment can be progesterone or intrauterine progesterone or oral progesterone or GNR analog till now, till you had the ulipristil. That's where extra buffer had come. So we will see whether we can do that. When it comes to surgical, we had the minimally invasive, what Dr. Niranjan told about the UA uterine artery embolization, microwaves, and you have the, um, the, uh, the uh, myoshirts and all those fiber myomectomies, which we had when we are doing that. So what are the limitations of current therapy? See, still, it is a surgical treatment, which is preferably because like I tell my patients, if the fibroid, the, most of the time patients ask me, do you think the fibroids are going to come back again? So the my standard is, so the one which I have removed will not come back. But another thing can always come back. The risk I have or my colleagues have, she's going to have a little extra risk because they have the epigenetic and genetic factors which are going to be there. So surgical intervention still predominantly is a treatment strategy because the outcomes they want to have within three months, they want to go for pregnancy. But for those who do want to go for pregnancy, then there is something which we can offer where surgery is not the mainstay. So GNRH analogs were licensed, but only short term because in Indian, especially with the history of osteoporosis and thin people, people going in for zero size, we know the osteoporosis is going to be very high and GNRH analog is not going to be the ideal treatment for them. That's where we have ulipristil. So let us talk about it, why it went into out and why we want it back. So it is SPRF. So it is a progesterone receptor modulator. So it acts on the progesterone agonist and it has antagonist effects both at the level of pituitary, at the level of fibroid, at the level of endometrium. So everywhere it has this effect. So it acts on the co-repressor and co-activator and accordingly the transcription is activated or not activated. 
So at the level of fibroids, it's going to act at the expression of metalloproteinases. So it causes the inhibition of proliferation, induction of apoptosis. So there is a size reduction. At the level of pituitary, pseudomenopause. So inhibits the LHFSH, so estradiol dial is coming down. So the menopausal syndromes can still be there, but much better than GnRH analog. At the level of endometrium, it causes the amenorrhea, just like Mirena, and causes the bleeding to come down. So all the three levels, you're going to have the effect at the level of pituitary, contributing to controlled bleeding and amenorrhea. Level of myoma, reduction of fibroid volume, endometrium, controlled bleeding and amenorrhea. So once we know Edil Mange more, we always want more things. So it's one thing which is giving us with one rupee, you're getting four out of four. I think Indians as such have this feeling of how to save everything for us. So we always think this is a better thing. But is it really better? Did we have something? How did we overcome it? That's where we are. So pharmacokinetics is rapidly absorbed. Within 38 hours, the, the half-life is uh, uh, there. And it acts to cytochrome P450. And we do know the ovary, PCOS, everything, including adrenals, acts through the cytochrome P450. It's high bound to plasma proteins and elimination is through feces only 10 percent is through urine so ulipristal the dcgi has again approved in 2021 in october why did it approve where did it approve it now says that wherever the surgical procedure is not appropriate means around perimenopausal postmenopausal woman wherever it is the uh, not appropriate that's where you should be using this so we have a very niche group where we can still use it to control the symptoms of fibroid but it cannot be used while waiting for surgical treatment there we can still use general channel log. but we have a huge group around 45 48 they go for the master plan master health plan where the scans tell fibroid of two centimeters just now how dr sirisha from karim nagar has asked uh, two centimeter fibroid two centimeter fibroid now asymptomatic it is there it is going to affect the psychology of the patient there is not fit for surgery i think these are the patients where you should be looking at ulipristal so where surgery is not ideal you have the thing so you are looking at how many courses with a long course that's when all the studies have come it is a five milligram daily one for three months tablets may be taken with or without food now you have the regular contraindications like any drug which is patient is pregnant breastfeeding any bleeding genital bleeding cancer to be ruled out all these if any hormones you're having these exclusions which we don't use then as usual we have to divide the degrade divide of american and european we have pearl study one two three four from european coming up American study Venus 1, Venus 2. So it's something to do with Venus. It has to be diamonds or pearls or Venus, right? So it has to be with the woman. So we deal with pearls and Venus. So the first pearl study one is to know whether it is effective or not. So any study one, phase one study is about versus placebo. And that's where the study came out with 5 milligram, 10 milligram and placebo. And it, there is the inclusion criteria of 18 to 50 years and size of uterus was less than 16 weeks size. And the BMD, look at the BM, BMI, 40 kilograms, hemoglobin 10.2, and any fibroid more than 3 centimeter, but less than 10 centimeters for utilizing this medical management. So these are the exclusion where any surgical management or UAE was done, they are not given any Mirena or any progesterone given again. When any woman or any other treatment is not included and no cancer and polyp or cyst. Now, end points are bleeding should come down to less than 75% PBSC or fibroid volume should come down. Secondary endpoints are, again, the quality of life, pain, and amenorrhea. So the results, when we look at results, if you take it here, with 5 milligrams, the volume of fibroid came down to 23, 21%, and you have the PBSC score coming down to 75, 91% of patients, and with 10 milligram, 92%. Placebo, it's only 19%. So you have the huge different statistically relevant thing where rate of amenorrhea also increases to 73 to 82%. In conclusion, it is very effective in dealing with excessive bleeding and pain. So when it came to phase two, that is uh, that the Pearl 2 trial, now we know that it is effective. Okay, bye, it is effective. But is it less effective than GNR Genalog or not? So we are doing versus versus study. Versus study is with GNRH analog. That is where it is a Pearl 2 study with GNRH analog. That is, we have one phase for one cc northern saline, one, one, one hand of uh, ulipristal, and one hand of um, uh, the GNRH analog. That's where, again, the inclusion criteria remained the same, exclusion criteria remained the same, and the endpoints have been, again, the level of estradiol here, because we are talking about the GNRH analog, where the pseudomenopausal state comes, and that's where we are looking at secondary <laughs> endpoint and primary endpoint so what is the outcome with 5 milligram 90 percent reduction in pbsc 
10 milligram 98 percent and even lupride it is 89 percent means similar and the volume less also is almost similar 36 to 53 percent reduction amenorrhea is again 7 percent 21 days and 11 percent hot flashes versus 40 percent hot flashes the side effects are less with equivalent effect in the positive effects so then came the pearl 3 study where it said how how long can we give is it only three months or can we give how, safely how long? That is where the extension study came, where we gave for three months, then gave a gap. Till the second cycle comes, and then second cycle, again, another cycle of three-month course of uliprestal 5 milligram was given. In the middle, norethistron is given to continue the amenorrhic stare or with placebo. So we only looked at this with a similar inclusion and exclusion criteria, and that's where the extension study went up to four cycles. So we had given 10 milligram or 5 milligram first study, then waited for the cycle to come if necessary menstruation or biopsy if necessary then again three months then again a gap of three cycles three two months and again three months and three four cycle study was given for the extension study and the end points were how good the amenorrhea was the bleeding was less and assessed for no bleeding spotting bleeding or heavy bleeding and continuous period for about the amenorrhea of 35 and secondary end points were the sizes the large largest fibroids which has decreased pain and quality of life so repeated three month course at 10 milligram, 79.5% reduction with the uh, 10 milligram. And when it is 89.7% if norethistone is added. Reduction of size is also 72.1% if norethistone is added along with it, the change of the other uh, symptoms. So now we know it is safe, it is effective, better than uh, GNR channel log. And we also know that you can give for four cycles. Now it comes to actual safety or wear study, what we call it with vaccine. When we do the effectivity study, then is it safe? That's when the Pearl 4 came up, where it is safety study was there. And when we did about in uh, 46 meta analysis of 46 studies were done, and it is just a very safe. In this study, in the European study, that's when about eight cases came up where we spoke about how the liver function might be affected in few patients where if we are not careful about LFT. That's where the uh, changes had then but the other studies like you know where the PAAC levels they were same and they were not progressing and there was no malignancy and it was not going forward in any of the patient the productions the reduction of size was also stagnant so pearl one it is effective pearl two it is produces faster and more consistent than general channel log pearl three long-term treatment is very effective pearl four is very little difference between five and ten so five is good enough we don't have to go for ten so we all decided it is a five milligram, which is more than enough. So this has proved about how eff efficient this was. And we were using left, right, center with five milligrams. That's when we had the um, American studies of Venus 1 and 2 coming up. It is almost a similar thing with only five milligram, 10 milligram and the placebo with the same uh, outcomes of play, primary point and secondary point. And the primary end point was 47.47% uh, coming down to the reduction of the PBSC and 53% reduction of the size of fibroids and amenorrhea 11 days and quality of life was improved. So both Europeans and Americans agreeing to the same thing. It was much easy for us Indians to follow it because as usual we say, so we started following it left, right, center. Then came the, the parameters of uh, Venus efficacy and everybody agreed about the safety and uh, the premier safety coming and saying about health related quality of life, which was very, very effective. About 1473 patients were recruited from 73 clinical studies in the European study. The results said 60% which was much improved, 87% was greatly improved and 2.6% discontinued because of side effect. This is where everything stopped. 2.56% discontinued. Then the real world scenario came up where they said reduction of size is only 56.5%, improved menorrhagia in 86%, perception of pain decreased in 80%, and mean reduction of surgical blood loss is also very, very less. But normal algorithms came up by FIGO. When Sir was talking about whether patients should be operated or not, everything depends on the FIGO classification. Type 0 and 1 should be operated. Type 2 and 3, if it is causing infertility, should be operated. 4, 5, 6, individualized. Anything more than 3 centimeter, better operate individualizing the case. So we are very clear about surgical criteria when to operate, when not to operate. But can we give uliprystal in these cases? Yes, type 0 and 1 also uliprystal can be tried before trying the hysteroscopic removal because the amount of bleeding will come down and it is easy for us to do a hysteroscopic resection. 
So this is where again desire for pregnancy, no desire for pregnancy. We went ahead and started doing the surgeries. And pre-menopausal women wishing to pre preserve the uterus, four courses have been proved to be effective in giving the treatment. So the safety concern background came up when European Medicine Agency Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Group came up with eight cases of the hepatitis acute fatty liver with liver transplant needing in five patients. And why did, uh, why did it happen and what is the thing how to limit? So this is how the assessment committee came up with and these are the other drugs which are causing this. And then what exactly happened in 2020 is the review showed, yes, this assessment committee has showed that the liver failure can happen. Transplantation was needed. After remo removing everything else, uh, we know that ilipristal is a cause. So then we, it, was, it was told to us that contact your patients immediately and see the LFTs. And if the patients have a symptom, stop the medication. Then, then we did stop it. Luckily, in India, we never had one patient also with this. Probably, like I always say, our, farm, um, our um, uh, progesterone lipid profiles are different. The way our progesterones act are different because of our um, lipid profile uh, and the basic um, levels of lipoproteins which we have. We did not have any liver damages in India. So it was banned by DCAG uh, in 2020, but there was a revisiting of the uh, drug because of the effectivity. And in 21, 10, 2020, we revisited. And in uh, 2012, 11, 2020, uh, we were now allowed again to use with a 5 milligram of UPA, but with very clear cut conditions. What, it, what is it? It can be used in premenopausal. That is the site of PAPE, set of PAPE and where they always will be waiting for the menopause to come where it can disappear versus when you just use medicine at that time. Drug treatment should not be used when the time waiting for surgical. So when the surgical will not be uh, utilized, this can be used. Warning regarding liver toxicity should be given but can be used. LFT should be done prior to the course and 15 days after. But drug, if at all LFT shows some changes, then we should stop it. So measure LFTs. Do LFTs every 15 days, but it should be given for these patients in the perimenopausal age group where surgery uh, uh, can, might not be offered and it will not be work. This is what is the thing. So we should know when to use, when not to use. That is what will make us a better uh, doctor than uh, abandoning a medicine which is actually very, very effective. So summarize, UPA is very well tolerated and very effective medicine and it should be used with um, a better alternative knowing when to use because the effectivity rate is as high as 90% both in the bleeding and the all the other symptoms of uh, doing it. So I hope Dr. Niranjan, I could... Uh, at least give some insight into the usage of uh, where uh, we can uh, um, use the ulipristal, which is a really a um, very good medicine instead of just blanket statement that we should uh, be stopping using it. Yes, madam. Wonderful presentation. You have gone through all the trials which are there. The Venus trial, the Premier trial. Before that, we had the Pearl 1, 2, 3 trials. And now... Ulipristal has come back again. All the things which were there in the minds of people regarding its application and its use has been totally vindicated by the FDA and by the Drug Control of India. And it is now absolutely without any problems. We can go ahead and still use it for the medical management which you have already told all of us today where even uh, the patients can be easily managed only thing is that madam as you suggested we need to do some proper observations so madam regarding monitoring how would you once you have started ulipristol can you please guide us on that issue we would actually start off uh, doing LFT prior first and we know it is going to be fine when it is fine we start it off then two weeks into the thing I would prefer to do once and if it's normal that's it and in between I would not do it again only the in between before starting the second one or before starting the third one we would be going we had lots of patients in the perimenopause whom we had given ulipristal and we never had even when FDA started telling us very um, uh, these things also, 
In India, we never had any patient having any LFT abnormality with uh, ulipristal. So I think instead of going with whatever they say, we should have our own study which says even one patient, we never had any uh, thing. I think all these companies should come up with our own trial of ulipristal. Yes, but being uh, learning from others' mistakes is very, very important. Like I always say, we have to either learn from others' mistakes or we should learn from our own mistakes rather than being we should never learn. So when we want to learn from others' mistakes, we know that they had a problem with liver function test so we should do the liver function test see whether they are already if they're already having a liver issue we adding to it and putting the blame on the medicine is not the right way to go forward absolutely and uh, madam everyone is reluctant not all of them are very very keen to undergo a laparoscopic surgery or an open surgery especially when you have girls which are in adolescent age there are young women who are, you know, just to be getting married. They come even, you know, just before the marriage, the the fiancé comes with the girl and the lady comes there. They are absolutely in tears. They don't want to undergo any surgery. And they have been scared, you know, if it will increase, then cancer will increase, this will increase, that Is there any possibility of some non-invasive method? They have tried non-invasive method as Sir has also suggested. We have our in our own department and I am sure madam all most of the places now they have FUS and all that but still you know the settings are very very costly to that extent. Uh, I, 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 and yes. we have very clear cut guidelines, nice guidelines. They have to be only five or six and the size and it has to be, and it takes eight months for it to even show some amount of 30% reduction. I am not a fan of MRFUS at all. Uterine artery embolization does not work. Only bleeding, it will come down. The problem with uterine artery embolization is Koyor Karega, uska side effects or jo problems chalta rehta hai, jo where the, uter the fibroid will be jutting into the subendometrium and it starts falling down and we have the ble bleeding issues, the pain issues, we have to deal with those things. I am not a fan of all this, but adolescent age group, definitely myomectomy is the way to go. I am very, very clear about a, which age group I am going to suggest what. So in the adolescent age group, but again, size matters, location matters, where it is, uh, everything else matters. So, and how good you are as a minimally invasive surgeon matters matters not open surgery so a lot depends on what we are doing it and post-operative there is an associated adenomyosis we do know adenomyosis and myomas are usually coexistent in many of the cases these are the patient i would always give a genera genera post um, uh, myomectomy for three cycles that itself will help me in that and if she's not planning for uh, pregnancy after immediately I would put a Mirina after the, doing a myomectomy for her till she thinks of pregnancy but perimenopausal ulipristal Pre-adolescent age group, I would look at um, myomectomy followed by Mirena. So I think each age group, we should look at very clearly the number of fibroids. Any person having more than 10 fibroids will have a tendency to have more fibroids after the surgery also. Means they have a like epigenetic factor or the local factor which will have more propensity to develop. Now, what happens? Why the recurrence rates is more in it? One, they have a tendency to develop more. Second, probably we give GNR channel log where the seedling fibroids disappear during surgery and they actually come back again afterwards as a rebound. Plus, the plus they're so small that we did not touch them that they can actually grow after that because the inciting factors is also there. So we, instead of blaming that they have recurred, I think we should look at how to keep it under suppression after that also. And and Absolutely. Great, great. Madam, your personal experiences. See, this is what this TOG conclaves. Those are the embedding experiences. It's totally different in India. And it's what Madam has treated these patients and the usage of the drug, which makes it really, really helpful. I have been uh, sharing, uh, I would like to share my own personal experience. A lady who has been an of uh, officer herself, since 2013, she has been following with me for fibroids. One is a anterior wall fibroid, 3.5 into 2.5, 3 centimeter. Another one is a intramural fibroid, which is 3 and 1.5 centimeter. She's so scared of surgery to undergo. Though I would have just got ahead and told her hysterectomy. Today, eight years have passed. She is menopausal since last six months mind you when she had come that time probably eight years back she was uh, say 44 years of age 
टुडे शी इज फिफ्टी टू एंड एट इयर्स आई जस्ट पुल्ड ऑन एवरी सिक्स मंथ्स टू डू एन अल्ट्रासाउंड आई गेव अर नथिंग नथिंग एल्स बट सिंस नाउ यूली प्रस्टॉल एज कम अगेन आई स्टार्टेड अर अगेन एंड द साइजेज हैव रियली ड्रॉप डाउन एंड शी इज नाउ सिक्स मंथ्स पेरी मेनो पॉजल नाउ दिस फाइब्रॉइड विल श्रिंक ऑन इट्स ओन यू डोंट नीड अ सर्जरी सो दिस इज वॉट इज माई पर्सनल एक्सपीरियंस even adolescent girls or young girls who are just about to get married or even those who are in reproductive age madam out of 10 women i find six women having fibroids you mean to say or we mean to say as a gynecologist do we have to put every time a laparoscope inside or to do an open surgery and remove the fibroid it doesn't make sense it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense the same thing is matter yes and And, and and mind you this lady who has been following up with me for 8 years now she just has little bit of pain because of that you know some degeneration issues or having uh, you know the contractility which is there associated with the uterus or during some dysmenorrhea we just put her on some mefenamic acid tranexamic acid it solves the issues and just put her on medical line of treatment have patience have faith and i'll tell you her daughter her sister everyone will follow you as a gynecologist and madam very importantly you said now i would like to emphasize that you are given a patient on femoral embolization and after that you feel that the size has increased in, uh, decreased but what happens when the blood supply reduces and there is no concomitant uh, you know uh, parallel or overlapping blood circulation that fibroid goes necrosis it undergoes changes and that causes a death of the tissue in such a big fibroid and the patient still comes back with you with pain again and again so that was a very pertinent point madam uh, sorry i interrupted in between uh, uh, you madam but i thought i should share my experiences which are there and i'm sure it is going to go in a long way uh, to be there again there uh, is dr neeti dogra uh, who has written Till what size of a fibroid ule ule pristol can be given, madam? Please clear that. Ten uh, centimeters is the size of fibroid where all the studies were done. So upper lower limit of three centimeters to ten centimeters thing, and if it is type zero or type one, two centimeters were also given ule pristol. So this was the pre again the thing, but right now around peri uh, peri menopausal age group. For all the patients where we don't want to do surgery because patient do not want surgery and it is symptomatic, two centimeter to ten ten centimeter you can just give uh, uliprist. Absolutely, and just monitor her LFT. That's you it. can do just once in three months. That's fine. And to begin with, after as you said, rule out fatty liver of uh, you know uh, fatty liver. Simple and do an LFT, uh, madam. One more question is coming. Uh, this is apart from medical line of treatment because I know you are a very good endoscopic surgeon, and uh, obviously in cesarean section I would still love to put a laparoscope. I don't know when that day is going to come. I and think you know how to miniaturize the baby small and then again yes. put it back. Mm. Yes, yes, madam. There is a question from Tapan Kumar Naskar. Uh, will you recommend routine myomectomy during cesarean section? I do it. I do for every. I in fact do an antenatal myomectomy when it becomes suffocating for the patient and the viability of the baby is at a thing. I have done maybe oh. two thousand eleven. I have done the first antenatal myomectomy where the baby there were twins inside with again two big fibroids and babies for only twenty four weeks and uh, she was going into literally ARDS uh, uh, with those things. And after that also even recently we did an antenatal myomectomy of thirty six week size uh, uterus where the baby. Baby is only sixteen weeks, so unless we give space for the baby to grow, oh my god! That so this is something. Do, uh, the, this is something I have uh, read it. only in literature, but getting an Indian experience of a. Uh, uh, really, Doctor Niranjan, it is not at all uh, difficult when we do. We just have to put a duodenum drip, and when we do, it comes as a capsule. It does not bleed. I don't know why people get scared. Maybe in cesarean it bleeds little more, but antenatal does not bleed that much. So, so, so you are telling about endoscopic surgery or no, open surgery? No, 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 no. That is one thing we don't do. Endoscopy we only do for ovary in the pregnancy, not for uterus. Unfortunately, no. so in uterus you need to go inside and then go ahead and do an open yeah. surgery please remember because the amount of bleeding will be much more there should be no iota of doubt we don't want to take a risk of anything 
मैडम मैडम इट्स रियली द डिस्कशन इज गोइंग वेरी वेल एंड इट्स रियली गुड देर आर वन देर इज वन मोर क्वेश्चन दिस इज रीता मिट्टल फ्रॉम कानपुर एंड अनमेरिड गर्ल विद अ सब म्यूकस मायोमा सिक्स सेंटीमीटर्स हेवी ब्लीडिंग वॉन्ट्स मेडिकल लाइन ऑफ ट्रीटमेंट कैन शी बी गिवन दिस ड्रग let me tell you one thing dr meeta like i said what patient wants is not the right way we have to look at what she needs is what we have to look at so what she needs is submucosal type 0 it's a space occupying lesion inside the endometrium unless that goes nothing is going to affect so it's not about what she needs if it's type 0 it has to go type 1 it has to go so only if it is type 2 type 3 and all you can wait time if she's not bleeding so much like you say and it is type 1 type 0 you want to try i would say yes but if she is bleeding so much and there is a type 0 you have to remove the fibroid hysteroscopically yes this will help in the other fibroid which is there you can try if she is not agree but uh, my this thing in this case like dr niranjan said i am an endoscopic surgeon i would go and hysteroscopically remove it not laparoscopy also madam now we have got viewers who are not asking questions but they are so confident now after hearing all of us this is dr jyoti dang a 48 year old patient with sub mucous fibroid 3 cm size willing for medical line of treatment i gave her uliprostol and she doesn't want hysteroscopy this lady is from kota good very good. if symptoms are relieved we don't have to do anything else that is the whole point of this no dr niranjan the when we had a previous patient she is bleeding when she is bleeding and it is type 0 you need intervention here this patient was again sub mucosal maybe type 2 type 3 she was symptoms were there but responded to medical management now symptom free we don't have to do hysteroscopy for her so i think individualization of the treatment is the way we have to look at rather than putting a chapa mar treatment like ivf treatment i'm sorry but <laughs> no no madam ma- madam i absolutely agree we are talking about non invasive modalities today and medical line of treatment yes there is a role of laparoscopy there is a role of hysteroscopy there is a role of robotic surgery there is a role of open surgery like there is a role of doing a surgery in pregnancy yes. antenatally there is a role of surgery yes. during, during cesarean section yes. but do we have to do all the time surgeries and and, and and we need to have set up so i think it's it's really going good uh dr alka god bole yes i know madam she is from thana how many months in total uliprostol is safe i have tried in two patients for 9 months yes. with one month off every 3 uh, months both are doing fine in thane she is yes. from thane yeah four courses or three courses on an average we do give three courses definitely a uh, fourth course if you have having this thing you can still give a fourth course also so that comes to almost 12 months but as well three courses are well uh, documented all over madam i think you have given lot of confidence today to all of us those who are really really thinking of conservative line of treatment and giving those women who are scared of undergoing a surgery some hope or light which is seen at the end of the dark of the t- of the dark tunnel and i'm sure today people are going to go out with a broad approach to understand a simple lft to begin with maybe repeat again after one month do an ultrasound in a perimenopausal or a reproductive age woman or you get it done in even a adolescent girl try to understand her psyche it's very easy to say come aa jao i'll do this i'll do that it's it's not and you know what they recur again i have done 3 to 4 myomectomies in a patient who has come abroad to me from dubai every time after one and a half years two years because in their in in their religion they don't remove the uterus i said you you please go ahead and do the removal of uterus no i want to do a myomectomy so literally that's not an option so this is a wonderful discussion which is going on and a brilliant response has come from india madam i would like to reiterate 2000 559 doctors have joined in the last one year this is also a record with so many viewers because as you know there is plethora of webinars left right center madam this is my third webinar i am joining today this is the third webinar though i am moderating the previous one i was a guest of honor and in the morning i had one webinar with my team and in the night i have a dinner also with a round table meet so it's going crazy but surely even the dinner is virtual no madam the dinner is uh, actual now we are we are just off mask 
and we are going to have a round table meet now so this is a wonderful record with so many viewers being joining and alambic has created a record for this science journey with ensuring the reach of good science it's a right science good science good science communication through these tog webinars and i thank everybody once again all of you dr narendra malotra the encyclopedia of ultrasound non invasive methods ivf endoscopy and dr manjula anagani from hyderabad the dedication and the passion you can see her right now following her surgery a world famous i can see a very down to earth a very good endoscopist a good clinician and thank you madam for being there together with us and it is a pleasure i hope we are going to join soon meet shanta madam soon in the month of march march and uh, i i i i am moderating that but i don't know maybe i'll come in a wheelchair and moderate it yes thank you madam thank you so much